Welcome to this video on the Cauchy interlacing theorem. We have seen in previous videos that there are many different numerical methods to find the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of matrices, like the power method, QR method, and also spectrum slicing for symmetric matrices. So symmetric matrices very often have nice properties. And many of them are based on the fact that you can choose the eigenvectors to form an autonormal system. In this video, we will look at the Cauchy interlacing theorem, which, tell, which tells us something about the location of the eigenvalues of a matrix and the eigenvalues of sub-matrices. This video has only a few slides, but it's quite heavy on proofs. Because what we will do, and let me switch to the outline of the video here, um, we will look at um, first the courant fischer minmax theorem. And it is a characterization of eigenvalues in terms of a minimum and a maximum. So that is going to be the bulk of this video, the proof of this theorem. And then we will use it to prove the Cauchy interlacing theorem. And I will shortly recap also what the Cauchy interlacing theorem tells us. And I'll end up with a summary. So first of all, courant fischer So what does it say? Suppose that we have a symmetric square matrix. Well, as we know, a symmetric matrix has real eigenvalues. So let's denote these eigenvalues with lambda 1 up to lambda n, and let's order them. So lambda 1 is going to be the biggest one, and then biggest just like it, it's, if you would look at the real axis, it's, it's furthest to the right. So we don't look at absolute values here, but just at the size of the number itself. Um, and lambda 1 is the biggest, and then lambda 2, and so on, up to lambda n. Then for any eigenvalue, you can give a characterization. So lambda k, so k can be anything, 1 up to n. And let's see what it says here. So let's read from, from right to left here. So here are Rayleigh quotients. So we have seen these before. Um, if you would pick for x um, in this formula that's in the red box, an eigenvector, then you would find the corresponding eigenvalue. But now we can take any vector, that is to say, we are going to take vectors from a subspace, which is called S here, and we want it to be unequal to zero, otherwise we would have division by zero, that's just scaling. Um, and then for these spaces S, what we are going to do is we are going to pick spaces in Rn with dimension n minus k plus one. And then we want to have that space as for which we minimize the maximum. Okay, so that, that, that's, that's what it says. And maybe during the proof, um, it will become a little bit more clear what we're actually saying here. So let's see. What I'm going to do is, of course, I'm going to pick the eigenvectors. And since our matrix here is symmetric, I can pick them such that they form an orthonormal system. So that's what I will do. So let me go to the proof here. So let me start on this slide and I will need a couple more. Um, so proof. Um, so let's u1, u2 up to un be eigenvectors. And of course, they correspond to lambda 1 up to lambda n. Um, so I'm going to pick them in such a way, so take such that um, the length of ui, well, let's denote that with uk here, because apparently in the theorem, I liked to pick a k. So such that uk to norm equals one, and that u i u j equals zero if i is unequal j. So they are orthogonal, that's what the second statement here says, and they have length one, I've scaled them. Now I have to prove something for general k, so pick a k, 
one, two, n. And now the interesting bits are going to come. So let's take some more space here. Um, so what I'm going to do is introduce a space S K. So I, I need to be talking about a minimum and maximums of some spaces S. So first I'm going to define the following space. So I'm going to say um, that S K is going to be the span, so all linear combinations of the first k eigenvectors. And now what I would like to show is this. I'm going to show that if you take now the maximum um, x in s x unequal to zero a x x x x with a Rayleigh quotient that this is larger equal lambda k for any space that has the dimension in the theorem so for all spaces for all s part of Rn with the appropriate dimension. And if you would go back to the previous slide, I'm not going to do that now. Um, N minus K plus one. So what we then have is that this complicated expression with minimum, maximum and so on, we have that for any of the spaces there we have a larger equal and then later on I'm going to also show that we have a smaller equal for some space and then we have the equal sign. So that, that's a bit of the outline for the proof, but this is going to be the first part. Um, so let me put a little bullet here because this is going to be the first bit. And of course I'm going to be needing this space SK that I just introduced. So I need to show something that holds for any subspace S. So now I'm going to pick one of them. So let S be such a subspace. So let S be a subspace of Rn with dimension n minus k plus 1. Now this S has this dimension. Clearly Sk that I have here has dimension k. So if they would be completely disjunct, completely separate, then I could add the dimensions and then the union of S, K and S would have dimension N plus one. But of course that is not possible in Rn. In Rn we have maximum dimension N. So apparently um, the intersection between S and SK is non-empty. So, because dimension SK plus dimension S equals K plus N minus K plus one equals N plus one, we know that S intersection SK is not equal to the zero vector only. Of course, they always contain the zero vector, so that's in the intersection, but I can also find a non-zero entry there. So what I'm going to do is choose X in the intersection, and I want X to be non-zero. And with the dimension argument, I know that I can find such an X, that it exists. And now something interesting is going to happen. Because on the one hand, this X is in SK, so I can write it as a linear combination. So let's use that. So 
axis in the intersection. So in particular, it is in SK. So we can write it as a linear combination. And let's do the sum j is 1 up to k, and then some coefficient, let's call them b dot j, u j. And using this, I'm going to compute the Rayleigh quotient. So let's see. I want to say something. about the Rayleigh quotient AX in a product with X over X in a product with X. Now, since X, let's go back here, is this sum. Um, so let me outline this. The UJs are the eigenvectors. So AX, what happens is that I can just if I write an A here, I just get a lambda J here, lambda J. And if I take inner products, then all the inner products with U, I, U, J, I, I, equal to J, they're all going to be zero. So this Rayleigh quotient is going to be quite simple. It is going to be in the numerator, sum J is one up to K. And then we get, um, beta j squared lambda j and then times one is the inner product of uj with uj divided by the sum j is one up to k beta j squared now since the lambdas are um, ordered by size I can say that this is bigger or equal the sum j is 1 up to k beta j squared lambda k because of lambda 1, lambda 2 up to lambda k, lambda k is the smallest one divided by the sum j is 1 up to k beta j squared. So let me add that here in different colors. So what I used is that lambda one is bigger equal, lambda two is bigger equal, and so on is bigger equal lambda k. And then next what I do, this lambda k, that doesn't depend on j anymore. So I can write it in front of the sum. And then you see that the whole expression reduces to lambda k. So what we have shown is that for any subspace S, the, the uh, quotient, the Rayleigh quotient, this, this maximum, is going to be bigger equal lambda k. So the last bit of the proof, so last part of the proof, choose an S, so a subspace S that has the required properties um, such that we don't have larger equal, but we're going to get smaller equal. And then we have equality. Um, choose an S such that the maximum X in S x unequal zero, a x comma x over x comma x is less or equal lambda k. So that's the last bit that we want to prove. So I, I have to pick a certain subspace S and what I'm going to do is the following. Let's do that on a new slide. So I'm going to give you the space works and then show you why it works. So I'm going to take S is the span UK, UK plus one up to 
u n. So if you would look back at the space s k that we introduced earlier, that one also contained u k. So u k appears in both s k and s, and then s has all the other eigenvectors in there. So it is clear that the dimension is n minus k plus 1, because that's the number of factors we have. And with the same dimension argument that we used before, um, we can find a non-zero x in the intersection. So take x in s intersection s k x unequal zero. But now what I'm going to do is I'm going to use that x is in the s space. So then in particular, x is in s. So I can write it as a linear combination k up to n. Um, let's say gamma j u k u j of course sorry u j so I can find some coefficients that I can write x as a linear combination of these vectors because the space s is, is the span of those vectors so they form a basis of that space Kidoki. And like before, I'm going to compute the Rayleigh quotient. So we have ax comma x over x comma x. So in the numerator, we now get some j's k up to n gamma j lambda j uh, and gamma squared of course and below here we get the sum j is k up to n gamma j squared and i'm going to use a similar argument but now if you look at the lambdas that are in the sum they range from k to n so if I replace lambda j with lambda k, I am making it um, bigger. So what we get is less or equal sum j is k up to n gamma j squared lambda k over some j is k up to n gamma j squared and what i used here is that lambda k is bigger equal lambda k plus one bigger equal all the other lambdas bigger equal lambda n and of course i can write this as lambda k so that gives the order inequality and that completes the proof of the theorem that we wanted to give so that is the um, courant fischer theorem and the reason i prove this is that i'm going to use it to show the cauchy interlacing theorem so let's first look what that meant again so what the cauchy interlacing theorem tells us is the following so consider a square symmetric matrix and let a j be the jth order leading principal submatrix so that's just a very long name for the top left block that has size j by j and then the eigenvalues of a j interlace the eigenvalues of a j plus one they're located in between that's just what it says so again 
what that means. A J has J eigenvalues, and we could label them like this: J superscript J subscript K, and K ranges from one up to J. I label them in order, and then what it means is that the kth eigenvalue of the J by J block is located in between those of the J plus one block. So in a graph that makes it even more clear, if we take the one by one upper left block, that's just a number that has one eigenvalue, then the two by two upper left block has two eigenvalues. And what the theorem tells us is that the red one is located in between the two green ones. Then the green one here and the black three by three ones, so the green ones are located in between the black ones. And finally, the black ones are located in between the blue ones that we see here. So that is what the Cauchy interlacing theorem tells us. And now with Courant Fischer, we have sufficient information to actually prove this. Now you can probably imagine that if you pick a matrix, you don't have to do that for all of the submatrices. If I do it for one of them, so if I show it for, for J and J plus one, then I'm done. And to make it a bit easier with notation and so on, I'm going to show it for um, basically the situation we have here, this one and this one. So the full matrix and the block, the n minus one times n minus one upper left block. So let's try to, uh, to prove this. So um, I am going to need a new slide for that. So I'm going to try and prove the Cauchy interlacing theorem. And so what we need to show, so proof, So we need to show that the eigenvalues lambda superscript j, so the k by k top left block, and then k, and k can be anything from 1 up to j, is located. between the eigenvalues lambda j plus one k and then here k is running from one up to j plus one so I write eigenvalues, so these are eigenvalues of AJ, the J by J, top left block, and these are eigenvalues of the J, AJ plus one, A superscript J plus one, the J plus one times J plus one upper left block. And I'm going to make a choice to make it a little bit uh, easier on the notation. So I'm going to do this for j is n minus 1. So what I need to show is that if you have the uh, the black eigenvalue on the previous slide, lambda n minus 1 k, and that's an eigenvalue of a n minus 1, that it is located in between two eigenvalues of a n, and that is the full matrix a. And then with the indices, it would mean that you have lambda n k here and lambda n k plus one here. Um, and just to recall then, this is of course just the eigenvalue k plus one of the original matrix, and this is lambda k of the original matrix A. So I'm going to use Courant Fischer for this. That, that's why I showed that before, so the min-max criterion. So let's see what Courant Fischer tells us 
what characterization it gives for this eigenvalue. So what we have then is if you would look at the courant Fisher Fisher for lambda n k. So what it says is that you can write lambda n k as the minimum over all subspaces of Rn with dimension n minus k plus 1. And then we take this maximum of the Rayleigh quotient. So the maximum x in S, x unequal to 0, ax, comma, x divided by x comma x now I'm not only going to use it for this one I'm also going to consider um, the the eigenvalue um, so in in the picture here I'm also going to look what it says for for this eigenvalue so the eigenvalue of the uh, smaller matrix the n minus 1 times n minus 1 top left block so let's see what we get there. So courant Fischer for lambda n minus one. Okay. So what we get here is well almost the same, right? So just a few numbers are going to change a little bit. So first of all, we're going to take a minimum and then the, the space is smaller because we have an n minus one times n minus one matrix. We get that S is a subspace of R n minus one. And then the dimension of S is going to be n minus one minus k plus one. So that equals n minus k. And then we have the maximum. And I'm going to write y now, because we have we have a smaller vector. It has n minus one entries. So I'm going to call that y. And of course, y should be unequal to zero. And then we get here a n minus one y, comma y over the inner product y comma y. Okay. And what what the idea now is is that this y vector lives in R n minus one. If I would add one entry to the vector y, then I would get an R n in the full space. So let's put a bullet here. So for any y in R n minus one, define the vector x to be, well, the vector y, and then we add a zero. And then we have a vector in R n. And if you would now look at the dot product the dot product a n minus 1 y comma y well with this new vector x i can also write that as a x comma x they are the same because i just added the zero there it doesn't change and also they have the same length if you look at the two norm so the two norm squared is the dot product y comma y that is the same as x comma x because i just added zero there that doesn't change the length of the vector okay so what 
what I can do now is rewrite this criterion here to a criterion that holds in Rn um, by extending the vectors. So what I'm going to do, and I'm going to write that on the next slide, is I'm going to give another characterization for lambda n minus 1k. So I'm going to say that lambda n minus 1k is, and then we get the minimum. And now I'm going to choose s in R n, so the full space, dimension n minus k plus 1, and then the maximum. And previously we had y here, and, and that was in R n minus 1. But now I'm going to go to the x, And to not change the condition, I'm going to require that x n equals 0. So that corresponds to extending the y vector by adding a 0 below it. So here I just write it in a different way. I put it as an extra requirement. And then we just have a x comma x over x comma x. So if you would now compare this to, so I'm going to compare what we have here, this characterization for lambda n minus 1k, and I compare that to what we had here, and then you see that they are almost identical, except that in the characterization on the next slide, I have an extra requirement here. So what we have is the same expression, only this is an extra requirement. So extra requirement, if you compare it, so with respect to the expression for on lambda n, k. So what that means is that we take a maximum over a smaller set. And if you take a maximum over a smaller set, it means that the number is going to be, the maximum is going to be lower. So what we have, so what follows here is that lambda n minus 1 k is less or equal lambda n k. The reason being that we take the maximum this, oops, this maximum here, that we take it over a smaller set due to the extra re requirement that we impose. Okay, so that, that's half of the proof because we needed to show that um, this eigenvalue is located between this one and the next one of the full matrix. So we're halfway now. Now, we can do something similar. Um, so what I'm going to do, so in the same way, I'm going to go back for a second to the previous slide. So if you look here at the characterization with Courant Fischer that we had for this eigenvalue, then I could change that in a different way. What I could also do is say, well, I am going to extend the minimum to Rn again and impose this extra requirement here and then also decrease the dimension. So that's a bit fake, but in global lines, that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to write down 
Um, first, the original characterization, actually let me copy that. So I'm going to copy this one to the next slide. Copy. Um, let me let me immediately go to a new slide because I need more space than I have left here. So what we have is this one. And I want to do a similar trick where I'm going to extend the y vectors to um, vectors in Rn by just adding a zero to them, but I'm going to do it in a bit of a different way now. So what I'm going to say is, well, I can also write this as the minimum, and then I let S be a subspa subspace of Rn now. And the dimension needs to be one lower, uh, bigger, sorry. Um, and then the maximum x in s, x unequal to the all zero vector, but x n needs to be zero. And then a x comma x over x comma x. Now, if you compare this one to the expression we had for uh, lambda n k plus one, then what you could say is that um, this is bigger equal than the minimum s in Rn dimension s equals n minus k maximum x in s x unequal zero because if you think about it then this here this restricts um, the space and you could say that this gives k minus one general requirements and with general, I mean that you could requirements. You could lower the dimension in several ways by making different components of the vector zero, for instance. And this one, well, that that's I, I call that a special requirement. One special requirement. Because I also lower the dimension but only by tuning the last component of the vector. And then this here gives k general requirements. So that sounds a little bit vague, but hopefully um, it is sufficient for you to explain why we have this bigger equal sign. <laughs> then, if you would look at Courant Fischer, then this here is precisely the characterization you get for lambda and k plus one. So, what we see is that apparently this eigenvalue is bigger equal this one. And that is the second inequality that we needed to show. So this proves the Cauchy interlacing theorem. So what we have seen in this presentation, which was quite heavy on proofs, is that we can characterize the eigenvalue of a symmetric matrix using the Courant-Fischer minmax formula. 
And then we can use this min-max characterization to prove the Cauchy interlacing theorem. And that is one of the essential ingredients in spectrum slicing methods for symmetric matrices. So methods, numerical methods, where we try to locate the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix by cutting up the spectrum, so basically the real axis, in parts, different intervals, that contain one or more of the eigenvalues of a symmetric matrix. So I hope this was clear, quite theoretical this video, and in the next videos we'll round up the spectrum slicing method. So thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.